The Truth About Jesus, the ACM Myth. Written by Mengersar, Margaretich, Mengersarian. Is Jesus a Myth? What is a myth? A myth is a fanciful explanation of a given phenomenon. Observing the sun, the moon, and the stars overhead, the primitive man wished to account for them. This was natural. The mind craves for knowledge. The child asks questions because of an inborn desire to know. Man feels ill at ease with a sense of a mental vacuum until his questions are answered. Before the days of science, a fanciful answer was all that could be given to man's questions about the physical world. The primitive man guessed where knowledge failed him. What else could he do? A myth, then, is a guess, a story, a speculation, or a fanciful explanation of a phenomenon in the absence of accurate information. Many are the myths about the heavenly bodies, which, while we call them myths, because we know better, were to the ancients truths. The sun and moon were once brother and sister, thought the child man. But there arose a dispute between them. The woman ran away, and the man ran after her, until they came to the end of the earth, where land and sky met. The woman jumped into the sky, and the man after her, where they kept chasing each other forever, as sun and moon. Now and then they came close enough to snap at each other. That was their explanation of an eclipse. Note, Child to the World, Edward Claude. End note. With this mythos, the primitive man was satisfied until his developing intelligence realized its inadequacy. Science was born of that realization. During the Middle Ages, it was believed by Europeans that in certain parts of the world, in India, for instance, there were people who had only one eye in the middle of their foreheads and were more like monsters than humans. This was an imaginary knowledge, which travel and research have corrected. The myth of a one-eyed people living in India has been replaced by accurate information concerning the Hindus. Likewise, before the science of ancient languages were perfected, before archaeology had dug up buried cities and deciphered the hieroglyphics on the monuments of antiquity, most of our knowledge concerning the earlier ages was mystical. That is to say, it was knowledge not based on investigation, but made to order. Just as the theologians still speculate about the other world, primitive man speculates about this world. Even we moderns, not very long ago, believed, for instance, the land of Egypt was visited by ten fantastic plagues, that in one bloody night every firstborn in the land was slain, that the angel of a tribal god dipped his hand in blood and printed a red mark upon the doors of the houses of the Jews to protect them from harm, that Pharaoh and his armies were drowned in the Red Sea, that the children of Israel wandered for forty years around Mount Sinai, and so forth, and so forth. But now that we can read the inscriptions on the stone pages dug out of ancient ruins, now that we can compel a buried world to reveal its secrets and to tell us its story, we do not have to go on making myths about the ancients. Myths die when history is born. It will be seen from these examples that there is no harm in myth-making if the myth is called a myth. It is when we use our fanciful knowledge to deny or to shut out real and scientific knowledge that the myth becomes a stumbling block. And this is precisely the use to which myths have been put. The king with his sword and the priest with his curses have supported the myth against science. When a man pretends to believe that the Santa Claus of his childhood is real, and tries to compel others also to play a part, he becomes positively immoral. There is no harm in believing in Santa Claus as a myth. But there is in pretending that he is real because such an attitude of the mind makes a mere trifle of the truth. Is Jesus a myth? There is in man a faculty for fiction. Before history was born, there was myth. Before men could think, they dreamed. It was with the human race in its infancy as it is with the child. The child's imagination is more active than its reason. It is easier for it to fancy even than to see. It thinks less than it guesses. This wild flight of fancy is checked only by experience. It is reflection which introduces a bit into the mouth of imagination, curbing its pace and subduing its relentless spirit. It is, then, as we grow older, and, if I may use the word, riper, that we learn to distinguish between fact and fiction, between history and myth. In childhood we need playthings, and the more fantastic and bizarre they are, the better we are pleased with them. We dream, for instance, of castles in the air, gorgeous and clothed with the azure hue of the skies. We feel the space about and over us with spirits, fairies, gods, and other invisible and airy beings. 
We covet the rainbow. We reach out for the moon. Our feet do not really begin to touch the firm ground until we have reached the years of discretion. I know there are those who wish they could always remain children, living in dreamland. But even if this were desirable, it is not possible. Evolution is our destiny. Of what use is it, then, to take up arms against destiny? Let it be borne in mind that all religions of the world were born in the childhood of the race. Science was not born until man had matured. There is in this thought a world of meaning. Children make religions. Grown-up people create science. The cradle is the womb of all the fairies and faiths of mankind. The school is the birthplace of science. Religion is the science of the child. Science is the religion of the matured man. In the discussion of this subject, I appeal to the mature, not to the child mind. I appeal to those who have cultivated a taste for truth, who are not easily scared, but who can screw their courage to the sticking point and follow to the end truth's leading. The multitude is ever joined to its idols. Let them alone. I speak to the discerning few. There is an important difference between a lecturer and an ordained preacher. The latter can command a hearing in the name of God, or in the name of the Bible. He does not have to satisfy his hearers about the reasonableness of what he preaches. He is God's mouthpiece, and no one may disagree with him. He can also invoke the authority of the church and of the Christian world to enforce acceptance of his teaching. The only way I may command your respect is to be reasonable. You will not listen to me for God's sake, nor for the Bible's sake, nor yet for the love of heaven or the fear of hell. My only protection is to be rational, to be truthful. In other words, the preacher can afford to ignore common sense in the name of revelation, but if I depart from it in the least, or am caught once playing fast and loose with the facts, I will irretrievably lose my standing. Our answer to the question, is Jesus a myth? must depend more or less upon original research. As there is very little written on the subject, the majority of writers assume that a person answering to the description of Jesus lived some 2,000 years ago. Even the few who entertain doubts on the subject seem to hold that while there is a large mythical element in the Jesus story, nevertheless there is a historical nucleus round which has clustered the elaborate legend of the Christ. In all probability, they argue, there was a man called Jesus, who said many helpful things, and led an exemplary life, and all the miracles and wonders represent their accretions of fond and pious ages. Let us place ourselves entirely in the hands of the evidence. As far as possible, let us be passive, showing no predisposition one way or the other. We can afford to be independent. If the evidence proves the historicity of Jesus, well and good. If the evidence is not sufficient to prove it, there is no reason why we should fear to say so. Besides, it is our duty to inform ourselves on this question. As intelligent beings, we desire to know whether this Jesus, whose worship is not only costing the world millions of the people's money, but which is also drawing to his service the time, the energies, the affections, the devotions, and the labor of humanity, is a myth or reality. We believe that all religious persecutions, all sectarian wars, hatreds, and intolerance, which still cramp and embitter our humanity, would be replaced by love and brotherhood. If the sex could be made to see that the God Jesus they are quarreling over is a myth, a shadow which credulity alone gives substance, like people who have been fighting in the dark, fearing some danger, the sex, once relieved the thraldom of a tradition which has been handed down to them by a childish age and country, will turn around and embrace one another. In every sense, the subject is an all-absorbing one. It goes to the root of things. It touches the vital parts, and it means life or death to the Christian religion. This is the end of Is Jesus a Myth?